In a frosty Canadian park, hidden deep beneath layers of thick ice, scientists discovered a bizarre skeleton they named the Frozen Dragon. The skeleton had been in the frozen ice for millions of years. It took experts decades to work out the species of this strange fossil. It was identified as a new genus of pterosaur. Pterosaurs were massive flying reptiles with wingspans of over 16 feet. Their heads were 3.5 times the size of their bodies. Pterosaurs lived 76 million years ago when they soared above the dinosaurs. Scientists described them as the biggest, meanest, and most bizarre animals that ever flew. The new genus has been named Cryodragon boreus, which translates to Frozen Dragon of the North Winds. In 2013, a young mountaineer was climbing one of the tallest mountains in Western Europe, Mont Blanc. He noticed a strange metal box poking out of the snow. The mountaineer pried the box open and found that it was filled with precious rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. The climber immediately handed the box to the authorities. It was discovered that the box likely belonged to a passenger on one of two flights from India that crashed into the mountain over 50 years ago. The box was valued to be worth over $200,000, and authorities are still searching for the heir to the small box of treasures. In northwest Siberia in 2007, a reindeer herder was on an outing with his sons when he noticed something strange in the ice. The man realized it was a frozen mammoth calf and immediately contacted the local museum. The calf was named Luba and was the best preserved mammoth mummy in the world at the time of its discovery. Luba had been in the ice for 41,800 years and is around 30 to 35 days old. From trunk to tail, the mammoth calf is roughly the same size as a large calf. If you're interested in seeing for yourself, Luba travels to museums all around the world. On the frozen continent of Antarctica, covered in layers of ice and snow, is Mount Erebus, the frozen volcano. The volcano was discovered in the middle of an eruption in 1841 by explorers on an Arctic expedition. The volcano is over 12,000 feet tall and has been active for the last 1.3 million years. Deep within the middle of the volcano is a huge crater filled with large volumes of molten lava. The volcano has occasional explosions, which means it's classified as being in continuing eruption. However, these eruptions are nothing to worry about because they're generally rather small. Back in 1991, two hikers were traveling across the Italian Alps when they stumbled across a body that they presumed to belong to a recently lost hiker. The duo trudged back down the mountain to report their unfortunate findings. Once the remains were recovered, it was clear that the body was not recent at all. Scientists determined that the Iceman was more than 5,000 years old and named him Otzi. The discovery was unlike anything scientists had ever before seen because the body was so well preserved. For years, Otzi was studied by scientists who discovered that our ancestors have a lot more in common with us than we ever knew before. Otzi was covered in ink body art. Research done on the contents of his stomach revealed that his last meal was dry cured meat, similar to the bacon we eat today. Otzi has at least 19 relatives living today, somewhere in Central Europe. Scientists were researching ancient squirrel burrows in Siberia when they came across something interesting. One of the squirrels had hidden away precious seeds deep beneath the ground. The seeds had been encased in ice for 32,000 years. The seeds were for the flower Silene stenophilia, which had long since gone extinct. Amazingly, scientists were able to recover plant tissue from inside the seeds and grow an entire crop of flowers. They've since reintroduced the previously extinct flower to natural habitats all across the world. In 1930, a team of Norwegian scientists sailed around the Arctic Ocean, conducting research on the seas and glaciers. They reached White Island, a dangerous and icy land no human had set foot on before, or so they thought. The scientists were shocked to discover the tip of a small boat sticking out of the snow. Frozen inside the boat, they found scientific equipment and various personal items, including a jacket monogrammed S.A. Andre. 
they had discovered the wreck of the famous Andre Arctic Balloon Expedition. In 1897, Swedish explorers, led by Andre, attempted to travel to the North Pole by hydrogen balloon. No one had ever heard from them ever again. People only found out what happened to them when the wreck was discovered 33 years later. It turns out that the balloon had crashed on White Island only two days after departing from Sweden. The explorers traveled along the island on a small makeshift boat, but were unable to make it any further. The best preserved woolly mammoth ever found was discovered in an area of permafrost in Siberia in 2010. Scientists named the frozen mammoth Yuka after the small village near where it was found. Yuka had been frozen for 39,000 years and is thought to have been around six to eight years old. Because Yuka is so well preserved, it has been studied for years and provided new information about mammoths. In 2019, scientists reported that they were able to activate cells taken from Yuka's tissue. Maybe one day, we'll have woolly mammoths roaming the land. From looking at pictures and videos of Antarctica, the continent appears to be freezing cold, covered in snow and flat, except for a few small hills. Scientists believe that too. When studying the Gumbertsev Mountains in the early 2000s, they were shocked to discover that the small rocky hills were actually the peak of a gigantic mountain formation under a mile of snow. Using radar technology, researchers worked out that the mountains are really around 10,000 feet tall and sprawl across 750 miles. This is around the same size as the European Alps, except hidden under tons of ice and snow. At a gold mine in Siberia, a businessman was examining a nearby river when he noticed something interesting in the frost. It was a small woolly rhino calf that was later named Sasha. The woolly rhino has been extinct for 15,000 years. It's thought that Sasha could have been frozen in the ice for up to 39,000 years. Sasha is unique because it's the only full-body woolly rhino to have ever been discovered. Glaciers around the northern Italian town of Palo have begun to melt. Artifacts from decades and even centuries ago have been discovered pouring out of the ice. Personal belongings from soldiers have been found, things like diaries, photographs, and even love letters. Historians have even uncovered an entire cabin preserved beneath the ice. The cabin was filled with hard metal helmets and clothes. In 1845, Sir John Franklin embarked on an ill-fated expedition to the North Pole. The crew traveled on two ships, HMS Erebus and the ironically named HMS Terror. The expedition met with disaster and both ships were lost to the icy waters. In 2016, the HMS Terror was discovered by a team of researchers. Despite being lost for 170 years, the freezing cold waters had maintained the ship in pristine condition. Scientists described the ship as frozen in time. Dinner plates and glasses were still on shelves, beds and desks were still in order, and even the passengers' luggage appeared to be in good condition. The HMS Erebus was also discovered nearby, but due to changing water conditions, the ship wasn't in great shape. The glacial ice surrounding a mountain passageway in Norway that was notoriously used by the Vikings has revealed hundreds of ancient artifacts. One of these artifacts was a giant unopened wooden box that was welded together. Researchers were beside themselves with anticipation, waiting to open this box. They believed it would be filled with Viking treasures or artifacts that would give us an insight into ancient society. When they opened the box, all that was inside was a plain old beeswax candle. It turns out that this box wasn't actually as old as they thought it was. By analyzing the candle, they discovered that the box dates back to the 17th century. The age of the Vikings had ended by the 11th century. It's likely that the candle box belonged to a farmer who was shipping it from his summer farm to his winter farm to light up the long nights. In 1952, an Air Force plane called C-124 Globemaster II crashed into a big mountain while flying from Washington to Alaska. Sadly, everyone on board, 52 people in total, didn't make it. The bad weather at the time made it hard to find the crash site, and even later, any attempts to locate it failed. But in 2012, a helicopter crew doing a training mission spotted the pieces of the crashed plane on a glacier called Colony Glacier in Alaska. 
They started looking for more pieces and confirmed it was indeed the missing plane. Since then, every summer for about a decade, different military groups have been helping in an operation called Colony Glacier. They've managed to identify 40 out of the 52 people whose lives were lost in the crash. The soldiers taking part in this mission take their promise seriously to never leave a fallen comrade behind. They believe it's their duty to bring back those who didn't make it. Another discovery comes from the Alps. In 1991, some hikers exploring the picturesque Alps stumbled upon a human body. It was half frozen in ice at the top of a mountain pass between Italy and Austria. At first, the local police thought it might be a mountaineering accident. But in a few weeks, archaeologists started claiming that this guy might have lived more than 5,000 years ago. They eventually gave the frozen fellow the nickname, Ertzi. He was named after the nearby Ertzel Valley. He's become quite famous as the oldest ice mummy on record. Ertzi's frozen state might not be as unique as we thought, and that's where things get really cool. Archaeologists have another theory. See, at first, everyone was convinced that Ertzi marked the start of a cooler period because he had been frozen in the ice without any interruptions since he had lost his life. Yet, over the past few decades, glaciers and ice patches worldwide have been melting away like ice cream on a hot summer day. Not just Ertzi, but other ancient relics like bodies, hunting gear, horse droppings, and even ancient skis started to appear. So, archaeologists say there are similar sites. They found quite a few, and they all fit perfectly into this growing field of glacial archaeology. It seems like as the world warms up, it will show even more ancient secrets from the deep freeze. Moving on to another amazing discovery. In 2018, William Taylor and Nick Jarman were exploring the snowy slopes of Mongolia's Altai Mountains. They found an ancient treasure trove hidden in the ice. Inside the trove, they found a well-preserved 3,000-year-old arrow shaft adorned with ochre markings. It was in pristine condition, a rarity for organic items that old. They found other items too, like a bronze arrowhead with bits of animal sinew still attached. All of these relics had been untouched for hundreds of years, since they had been locked in the ice. In Mongolia, rising temperatures have melted ice patches that remained frozen for centuries. Similar discoveries have been made in the Yukon, US, Italy, Siberia, and Norway. Thousands of sites have been identified. Yet, scientists are racing against time to document and preserve these artifacts before they're lost forever. The study of these artifacts challenges the definition of these environments as wildernesses and shows how indigenous people coexisted with nature there. Sometimes people find simple items too, as simple as a sandal. This one discovered on one of central Norway's mountain passes indicates that people used this route roughly 1,700 years ago. This suggests that there was less snow and ice in that area back then. The sandal, dating back to around 300 BCE, resembles Roman sandals of that era. Again, in Norway, hunters found an iron sword high up on a mountain, more than 5,250 feet above sea level. There's no nearby burial site, and it's puzzling why someone would have a sword in such a remote location. Archaeologists speculate that the owner might have become lost. Then, in 2011, unusual objects resembling giant slingshots began to emerge as the ice melted. Radiocarbon dating suggests that this particular object was crafted around 400 BCE. It measures over 3 feet long and has knife cuts. Those puzzled archaeologists until one team member recognized them as tongue or pliers used to secure loads on sleds when transporting hay or leaving for animal food. People in the area used hay sleds with pliers until the 1950s, when tractors became more common. Now, let's get back in time to thousands of years ago. We can easily do that by looking at this woolly mammoth. 
this creature looks a bit like a cherished but slightly worn out toy. This ancient giant, whose heyday was 39,000 years ago, is the best preserved mammoth ever found. Even its signature shaggy hair is surprisingly well preserved, having been trapped in glacial ice until its recent discovery in Siberia. This remarkable animal is stepping into the limelight in Yokohama, Japan. Scientists are running tests that might bring this extinct species back to life. When they stumbled upon this female mammoth, they uncovered a hidden treasure, a sample of her blood preserved beneath the ice. So they believe this ancient blood could hold the key to resurrecting the mammoth. They also found well-preserved muscle tissue. She was between 50 and 60 years old when she met her icy fate. The discovery of mammoth blood has reignited debates about the ethics of bringing back extinct creatures, like in Jurassic Park. Their ambitious plan is to implant an egg into a living elephant for a 22-month pregnancy, hoping that at least one living mammoth cell might survive. Hop on, we're going to the French Alps. We are at a spot not far from where an Air India plane tragically crashed 46 years ago. We're accompanied by a diligent mountain rescuer and his neighbor. They went to this area after a bunch of tourists had noticed a strange-looking thingy on a glacier. It was a bag. The Indian embassy in Paris got wind of it, and it was all set on getting that bag. What makes it kind of cool is that it had diplomatic mail and Ministry of External Affairs written on it. The Air India flight was on its way from Mumbai to New York when it took a nosedive in January 1966. It took 117 people on board down with it. Guess what else was inside the bag besides the soaked diplomatic mail? It had a stack of old Indian newspapers. So, alongside those, they also found bits of the plane's cabin, a lone shoe, and a bunch of cables. Totally unexpected treasures on that mountain. During the summer of 2013, Scientists stumbled upon a message left behind by a geologist named Walker, who had placed it there 44 years before. That message sort of served as the man's last testament. He passed away just a month after hiding the bottle in the rocks on the island. The content of the message was quite astounding. In 1959, Walker had measured the distance from those very stones to the glacier's edge, and it clocked in at a mere 167 feet. By 2013, that distance had ballooned to 400 feet. Researchers are convinced that this stark contrast between the two measurements underscores the consequences of ongoing global warming. Imagine the melting ice in Norway's mountains as a time machine revealing a treasure trove. Nearly 800 Viking artifacts tucked away for over a thousand years have been unearthed. They give us a peek into the bustling trade networks of the Viking era and the critical role of the mountain passes in this ancient commerce. Among the finds are leather shoes, cozy woolen mittens, stylish tunics, feathered arrowheads, horseshoes, walking sticks, and kitchen gadgets from the Viking chef's toolkit. There are even Viking pack horse souvenirs. These artifacts provide us with insights into ancient travel habits and the peak times when those paths were bustling with activity and give us a glimpse into the lives of adventurers. We're in Siberia. It's so cold here that freezing gusts of wind are burning your face. All that white snow seems to be blinding you. This place resembles Antarctica because of the permafrost. Recently, a group of scientists researched one of the local rivers. With the help of a drilling rig, they extracted several samples of frozen soil. The scientists were shocked to find living creatures inside the ice. Later in the laboratory, they realized that the creatures were microscopic multi-celled organisms known as deloid rotifers. These creatures looked like little worms. Scientists knew that these worms could live in frozen conditions for up to 10 years. But the age of the rotifers found in the ice was about 24,000 years. And after defrosting, they began to reproduce as if they had been sleeping for several hours, not thousands of years. Further analysis showed that these organisms could stay frozen for hundreds of thousands of years. 
the rotifers might have lived during the time when people didn't invent the wheel yet. And this isn't their only superpower. Deloid rotifers are among the most radioactively resistant animals on Earth. They can survive in places where there's no oxygen and water. They can also stay alive in areas with high acidity and can live without food and water for a long time. By the way, these are not the only creatures that are known for living for thousands of years. Particular types of moss and some microorganisms are also almost immortal. Nematodes, also called roundworms, are some of the most adaptive varieties of worms in the world. Imagine the Eiffel Tower standing tall and proud. And now, let's make it 10 times higher and place it underground. Exactly at this depth, many thousands of feet under the surface, scientists discovered these creatures. There's no sunlight and almost no air in this place. And since it's much closer to Earth's core than the surface of our planet, the temperature here is higher than in the middle of the hottest desert. Millions of tons of soil above create insane pressure. But all this couldn't prevent life from developing here. When roundworms run out of air, food, or when the temperature becomes too high, they get into a unique state of stasis, or deep hibernation. In this mode, the worm's metabolism slows down, and almost all the processes in their bodies stop. The creatures can sleep for a very long time, and only wake up when the environment becomes more livable. By the way, you don't have to go so deep underground to find these creatures. Nematodes are found all over the world. They can live in hot springs, deserts, high in the mountains, among the harsh ices of Antarctica, or inside animals and humans. Our next invulnerable creatures are tardigrades, also known as water bears. These are microscopic eight-legged invertebrates, closely related to arthropods. It's impossible to see them with the unaided eye. But a conventional microscope will allow you to see tardigrades in detail. They look like minuscule bears. They're called water bears because they need a thin layer of water around their bodies at all times. It's necessary to prevent dehydration. Tardigrades have been found in all kinds of environments, from ocean depths to sand dunes. They're incredibly robust thanks to their unique organism structure. Yeah, they look soft, but their body is covered with a tough cuticle. This coating resembles the exoskeletons of grasshoppers, mantises, and many other insects. Water bears shed their old layer of the cuticle when they need to grow. Each of their eight legs has four to six claws, which helps them cling to any surface. The bears can survive at a temperature that's almost three times as cold as the temperature in the ice of Antarctica. Heat doesn't harm them either. They have been proved to survive at the temperature that makes water boil. Also, water bears are not afraid of radiation and high pressure. In the depths of the ocean, Pressure can destroy alloys of the strongest metals, but these creatures can withstand pressures six times greater. But the coolest thing is that they can live in the vacuum of space. Our planet has a magnetic field. This is a shield that protects us from solar radiation. Tardigrades don't need this protection. They can go into near-Earth orbit and come back unharmed, all thanks to a protein protecting their DNA from ionizing radiation. Like other immortal organisms, water bears can fall into a state of cryptobiosis. Tardigrades pull their head and legs inside their bodies and fall asleep. If the surrounding conditions suggest freezing, drying out, or experiencing a lack of oxygen, they will remain in this barrel form until the situation improves. So those are microscopic organisms and microbes that can only be seen through a microscope. But how about something bigger? Meet ironclad beetles. They live in the southwestern U.S. and Mexico. These insects can not survive high temperatures, live without oxygen, or in conditions of increased radiation. But their shells are so tough that they can only be pierced with a drill or hammer. Their durable exoskeletons are made of a special substance, chitin. It can also be found in the armor of crabs or shrimp. And still, the chitin of the ironclad beetle is so durable that it allows this creature to withstand the impact of a car moving at high speed. In times of danger, they can hide their whiskers and strong legs in special recesses in their shell. Other animals can't bite through the armor, so they spit the beetle out and leave to look for lunch somewhere else. As soon as the danger disappears, the bug stretches out its legs again and goes about its business. Also, the armor saves the beetles from dehydration 
which is very useful in hot areas of Mexico and the southwestern U.S. Inside the exoskeleton, they can store moisture. In other words, these bugs can absorb water whenever they find it and transport this liquid inside themselves. The next creatures are incredibly fragile, but they know how to survive in places where almost no other animals can live. We're going to the southeast of Romania, near the Black Sea. Here, on a desolate wide plain, you can notice a pit. This is a mine leading deep underground. The air on the surface of our planet usually contains around 20% oxygen, but in the mine, it's only 10%. Inside the cave, the air also has an increased content of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide. People can't breathe there without an oxygen tank. We can probably say that the water and air there are poisoned. Almost no animals would be able to survive here. Still, 48 species of living organisms have been found in this cave. 33 of them are newly discovered species. And they aren't the only microbes or bacteria that can't be seen without a microscope. Something bigger lives here. Strange white snails crawl over the walls of the mines. Transparent shrimp and a bunch of unknown kind of leeches swim in the water. White centipedes with huge whiskers and creepy white spiders run on the ground. And they all have been growing here for almost 5 million years. You might notice a water scorpion and another unidentified species of this animal. It doesn't look like its relatives living in hot sands or tropical forests. No living creature here looks ordinary at all. All animals are either white or transparent. They have no eyes, but are equipped with long paws and antennae whiskers that help them navigate in this dark space. The deeper you go into the cave, the less oxygen the air contains. But the number of living organisms is increasing. The air is filled with methane and carbon dioxide. All the inhabitants of this cave have never seen the light of the sun and have never gone out of the darkness. It seems impossible to survive in such conditions where plants don't produce oxygen. The answer to the question of their survival is hidden in a small lake. The surface of the water is covered with strange foam. If you look closely, you can see that this white substance is alive. It resembles soft, wet paper that is easy to tear. The thing is billions of living organisms, bacteria called autotrophs. There's much more carbon dioxide in the cave than there is outside. And these bacteria, like plants, absorb it. But they don't do this with the help of photosynthesis, which means they don't need sunlight. They use water for chemosynthesis. What these bacteria secrete is food for other bacteria. And these other bacteria are food for bigger creatures. A unique food cycle that you can't find anywhere else on the planet only exists here. Throughout history, humans have used tattoos to protect themselves against sorcery, claim membership in groups, declare their love, honor their loved ones, or simply express themselves. And it looks like tattoos are going nowhere because as of 2022, 46% of the United States population has at least one. That's why it's not shocking that tattooing has taken the sixth spot amongst the fastest growing industries in the country. And it's safe to assume that this percentage will only go up. But have you ever stopped and wondered when this form of body modification came into existence and how it changed over the years? Let me tell you. Tattoos date back thousands of years. Have you ever heard about Otzi the Iceman? He's the 5,200 year old mummy who was found embedded in glacial ice in 1991 in the Otztel Alps. Yep, that's how he got the nickname Otzi. The reason I'm talking about him now is that he holds the record for the oldest tattoos in the Guinness World Records. He had 61 markings across his body that are considered to be tattooed by the experts. These markings are composed of vertical and horizontal lines which were created from fireplace ash or soot pigment. Otzi, however, was not trying to express his true self with them. When they examined Otzi's bones in detail, they noticed that there was age or injury-related degeneration on the tattooed areas of his body. This made scientists believe that his tattoos may have been related to discomfort relief treatments similar to acupuncture. That also explains the somewhat random distribution of those markings on his body. Experts also believe the fact Otzi had so many tattoos means that others in his culture knew about tattooing and that he wasn't the first person ever to have tattoos. 
Although Otzi's tattoos are considered to be therapeutic, evidence of figurative tattoos, which are images of real subjects such as animals and so on, were also discovered on two 5,000-year-old Egyptian mummies, as well as pushing back evidence of the practice of tattooing in Africa by 1,000 years. This discovery also holds the importance of changing the belief that only Egyptian women got tattoos. However, other mummies with tattoos have been recovered from at least 49 archaeological sites, including locations in Greenland, Alaska, and the Philippines, which only suggests that tattoos were a worldwide thing. But despite all this evidence that shows the art of tattooing is ancient and universal, the exact date of when and where it began is unknown. There are written records that date tattoos back to 5th century BCE Greece, where they were used to mark criminals and enemies so that it would be easier to identify them if they tried to escape. Romans and Persians also used tattooing for the same purposes. Other cultures, on the other hand, had different uses in mind. In the Philippines, tattoos were symbols of tribal identity, kinship, bravery, beauty, and social or wealth status. They were also believed to have magical abilities and were done as protective talismans against any evil supernatural forces. Consequently, the process of tattooing was believed to be sacred, therefore it involved some rituals. For example, if an artist or a person who was about to get a tattoo sneezed before the tattoo began, this was seen as a sign of disapproval by the spirits. So the session would be called off or rescheduled. And once a tattoo was complete, a celebration usually would be held on its behalf. When it came to ancient Egypt, tattoos were originally used to show a dedication to a deity, and they were believed to convey divine protection. What's worth mentioning here is the fact that many of the tattooed mummies discovered in Egypt were female. One of those mummies came to be known as Amunet, the tattooed priestess of Hathor who had a variety of tattoos on her body. When she was first discovered, experts initially thought that due to the placement of her tattoos, these were either done as a medical treatment for a lower body condition, or they were simply the markings of lower status. But in recent years, a further examination revealed that she was a person with high social status, so the previous theory was debunked. This discovery led some to believe that her tattoos possibly functioned as protection against the difficulties of pregnancy and childbirth. Now let's take a look at Japan's history with tattoos. Tattooing for spiritual and decorative purposes was widespread in Japan, and it actually extended back to at least 300 BCE. Some written texts also describe tattooing and other bodily markings to indicate social differences among Japanese people. By the 17th century, however, most criminals were tattooed as a mark of punishment. And by the mid-19th century, tattoos were banned altogether, and those who had them were viewed as lacking respectability, which in turn created a subculture of outcasts who formed the roots of the Yakuza. But how did the modern and more expressionist role of tattoos in the Western world begin? James Cook was a British explorer and captain who was famous for his three voyages to the South Pacific, which took place between 1768 and 1779. During one of these voyages, he traveled to the Tahitian Islands, where he was introduced to the art of tattooing. When he landed on the island, he was surprised and impressed by the heavily tattooed men and women, and he wanted to make note of them in his logbook. So, to describe their body art, he used the term tattoo after hearing the locals use a word that sounded similar to it regarding their markings. Before that, tattooing was simply referred to as scarring, painting, or staining. Many of Cook's crew returned to England with tattoos from this voyage, which, in return, restarted a tattoo tradition among the sailors. They started using tattoos as a way to record their travels. For example, they would get an anchor tattoo if they crossed the Atlantic Ocean successfully, or a shellback turtle tattoo if they crossed the equator. This paved the way for the traditional style of tattooing. By the 19th century, although tattoos were still largely associated with sailors, they had spread to British high society as well. 
During the 1870s, they had even become fashion statements among some members of the upper classes, as well as royalty. The people who had them among the high society included British Prime Minister Winston Churchill's mother, Lady Randolph Churchill, Prince of Wales, the future Edward VII, and his sons, as well as several of Queen Victoria's relatives. It was even rumored that she herself had a tattoo of a tiger fighting a python in the area of her body that could easily be covered with clothes, just in case. This all led to tattoos becoming a mark of wealth by the late 1880s. In 1891, the tattoo machine was created by Samuel O'Reilly, who was a New York City tattooer himself. His design was based on a modification of Thomas Edison's electric pen which was originally designed to help businesses with document duplication. It was also around the same years that tattooed women started to make appearances, though mostly in the circuses to entertain people. Although that industry eventually slowed down, by the 1920s, more women began to get tattoos as a cost-effective alternative to makeup, since products were so expensive at the time. In 1939, Mildred Hull became the first female to open her own tattoo shop in New York. It was around this time that the U.S. introduced social security numbers, and many citizens got theirs tattooed on their bodies as a memory aid. However, despite these tattoos, decorative tattoos continued to be looked down upon. If you had a tattoo during the 50s or the 60s, you would still be viewed as a rebel or a criminal by the majority of people. In 1961, the New York City Health Department actually banned tattoos because they saw them as the cause of spreading diseases. The ban was not lifted until 1997. Today, tattoos are so common that even toys have them. So there's no ban, no stigma, no style or color restriction, and nothing to stop you from getting the tattoo of your dreams. Maybe except your mom. Hidden in an Italian mountain range lies the Apennine Colossus. It might not have been on your travel list until now, but you'll be sure to add it once you hear its story. It's a massive statue located in Tuscany, Italy that's been turning heads for centuries. It stands a staggering 36 feet tall, which is pretty impressive. The Apennine Colossus was designed as a personification of the Apennine Mountains and was created over 400 years ago by Francesco I de' Medici. And get this, the statue draws inspiration from Roman mythology. If you're lucky enough to visit the Villa Demidoff in Italy, you'll feel the sense of mystery and beauty of the Renaissance gardens, and you'll see the nearby Apennine Colossus seemingly in pain. But don't worry, the statue is doing just fine. It's managed by the local authorities of Florence and is open to the public. When you see the statue, you'll notice that it's depicted as an elderly man crouching down on the shore of the lake in a suggestive and realistic pose. It also seems to be squeezing the head of a sea monster, and water gushes out of the serpent's mouth into the pond in front of the statue. The statue also doesn't have any clothes on and has stalactites in his thick beard. His long hair shows the fusion of a man and a mountain. To add to the realism, the statue was once able to sweat and weep with water pouring through a network of pipes running through its body. In the winter, it would sometimes get covered with icicles. If you're planning a visit, the best idea is to take a bus from Florence. Now, the Alps have some secrets of their own. This next story involves a French mountaineer that struck it rich on Mont Blanc. But it wasn't your average gold nugget or diamond ring that he found. No, he stumbled upon a metal box packed to the brim with precious jewels worth about $250,000. Now you might be wondering how in the world such a treasure ended up on the shoulder of Western Europe's highest mountain. It turns out that these gems belong to a passenger on one of the two Air India planes that crashed there, either in 1950 or 1966. Talk about a blast from the past! Now here's where things get really interesting. Our mountaineer, who was simply trying to conquer the summit, came across this hidden stash poking out of the ice and snow. He could have easily pocketed the loot and gone on his merry way. But instead, he chose to do the right thing and turn it over to the local police. Authorities had to track down the original owner or their family, and it wasn't an easy task. 
You see, these jewels had been hidden away for over 50 years, and it's anyone's guess who they truly belong to. This isn't the first time that the Alps have given up some of their secrets, though. One year prior, two climbers found a bag of diplomatic mail from the same plane that had carried the precious jewels. It's amazing to think that all these years later, such artifacts are still popping up on the glacier. Of course, there is a downside to these types of events. Some worry that inexperienced climbers might try to reach the area in search of their own treasures. But let's be honest, folks. Climbing areas like Mont Blanc is no walk in the park. It takes skill, experience, and endurance to conquer such a daunting peak. Pack your bags for our next destination, Greece. Have you heard of Davlus Cave? It's located in the Penteli Mountain, just a short distance northeast of Athens, and it's a total hotspot for spooky experiences. Visitors have reported water dripping upward, weird voices, electronics going out of control, glowing orbs, and more. One brave soul recounted venturing into the cave with his infrared camera. He captured what sounded like a choir of voices, chanting in ancient Greek, and even recorded unexplainable apparitions near the cave center. Feeling adventurous? Why not take a trip to Develis Cave? After driving through a maze of slopes, you'll have to leave your vehicle at the beginning of a dirt road. After walking up the unmarked trail, you'll then enjoy the panoramic views of Athens, stretching out to the nearby gulf. Finally, after about 25 minutes, you'll see a crescent-shaped opening in the rock leading to the cave. Some people that have experienced walking toward the cave remember feeling an intense pull. Once in the cavern itself, they realized they couldn't go much further, as the tunnels leading from the cave had been blocked up. It shouldn't stop you from imagining all the spooky creatures that might be lurking in the shadows. Hidden in the Carpathian mountain range in Romania is the Buchichi Sphinx, a fascinating rock formation that looks a lot like its Egyptian counterpart. It's made from a huge block of stone that's been eroded by the wind over a really long time. Now here's where things get pretty cool. The Buchigi Sphinx may only look like the Egyptian Sphinx from a certain angle, but that hasn't stopped people from coming up with all kinds of legends and myths about it. Some say that the Egyptian Sphinx was actually built based on the Buchigi Sphinx and that there's a time tunnel or energy corridor connecting the two. Mm Mm-hmm. Others believe that life forms from outside our planet must have built the Sphinx and even established their base on the plateau in the Buchigi Mountains. There's also a legend that claims the Buchigi Sphinx has healing powers. On November 28th, at sunset, the sun's rays supposedly form an energy pyramid around the Sphinx's face, which has a healing effect on those who gather nearby. People come from all over the world to experience this phenomenon and receive good vibrations from the energy pyramid. Some even claim to have been healed by it. Others have claimed to hear the beach voice. You know, good vibrations. Never mind. Now back when we had little knowledge of geology, people used to make up all sorts of stories of how mountains came to be. Mount Fuji makes no exception and has a fascinating myth behind it that's been told for generations in Asia. Once upon a time, there was a struggling farmer. The poor guy couldn't grow anything on his barren land, and his family was suffering. One fateful night, he was jolted awake by an earth-shattering sound. He thought it was the end of the world and woke his family to flee their hut. To their surprise, they witnessed the birth of a massive mountain, the mighty Mount Fuji. It was a miracle. The eruption created fertile soil, and the farmer, along with his family, could finally thrive. He even gave the mountain a cool name, Fujiyama, which translates to never-fading mountain. Japan is located in one of the most lively places on Earth. Yep, it's along the western edge of the Ring of Fire, a big horseshoe-shaped club that circles around the Pacific Ocean the eastern side of Asia, and the western coast of the Americas. It's a pretty popular spot for all sorts of geological activity. You know, like volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. This may sound like a surprise, but Mount Fuji is actually a volcano. It has a pretty impressive resume, having erupted more than 15 times since the year 781. The last time it did, it was preceded by a massive earthquake, 
of over 8 points on the Richter scale. That last eruption of Mount Fuji happened in 1707. It was so powerful that a nearby village was supposedly lost in the volcanic disaster. For centuries, nobody could confirm if the village ever existed. As time went by, new towns were built on top of the place where the remains of the settlement supposedly were. But in recent years, researchers dug deep and found some volcanic ash and charred remains of buildings, proving that the village and its destruction were, in fact, real. Now the mountain is considered dormant, having had its last signs of volcanic activity in the 1960s. Well, that's a relief. Antarctica. It was once a green land full of dinosaurs. But now it's a frozen continent bigger than that of the US that doesn't belong to anyone. It isn't hard to find. Wherever you go, just go south until you get to the big icy thing at the south pole of our planet. It lies within the Antarctic Circle, and it's the largest single mass of ice on Earth. The continent is bigger than the US and even bigger than all of Europe. And still, Antarctica was officially discovered recently. Scientists hadn't known of its existence until 1820. After the discovery, it took another two decades to confirm it was a whole new continent, and a few more decades after that to decide on a name. In Antarctica, anti means the opposite. So Antarctica literally means the opposite of the Arctic. Now even before scientists discovered the land, ancient Greeks already theorized that there must be a southern continent to balance out the Arctic in the north. Also, some scientists who studied Polynesian artwork and oral history believe that Polynesians found the continent over a millennia before the Europeans did. Anyways, today we all know of this icy land at the South Pole. Because of its location, there are just two seasons there, summer and winter, and both last six months. In summer, it's a bit warmer, and the continent exists in pure daylight. And in winter, it's dark all day long. 98% of Antarctica is ice. This continent alone stores 60% of the planet's fresh water. And yet, despite all those water reserves, Antarctica is the biggest desert in the world. By definition, a desert is an area with sparse vegetation and little snow or rain. Notice that plenty of sand isn't a necessary condition here, even though the continent does have some sand and even sand dunes. It also gets a lot of wind. Antarctica is the windiest continent on Earth, and wind speeds can reach 200 miles per hour. That's even faster than hurricane winds. The little snow the land gets never melts. It just builds up over time, for centuries and millennia. So there's a thick, thick ice layer there. This makes Antarctica full of hidden secrets. There's a whole new world underneath its ice. For example, there are a lot of mountains on the continent that are like 9,000 feet tall. It's taller than three Burj Khalifas stacked on top of each other, if we must. And that's currently the tallest skyscraper in the world. But we don't see all those mountains because they're all hidden under the ice sheet that is almost 16,000 feet thick. There's also a lake down there, beneath over 11,000 feet of snow. The lake is called Lake Vashtok, named after Vashtok Research Station, under which it's located. Originally, it was just a hypothesis. Over a century ago, a scientist suggested that the huge pressure created by tons of ice could decrease the melting point of ice in the lowest layers of the ice sheet, creating liquid water, which could form a lake. He didn't prove his ideas in his lifetime, but others continued his work and confirmed that this theory was true. There's also a canyon in Antarctica, hidden underneath huge masses of snow, too. It's deeper than the Grand Canyon we have in Arizona. There is a mountain range that divides the continent into two parts, East Antarctica and West Antarctica. The western part of the continent is experiencing higher temperatures and is starting to melt. If West Antarctica melts and releases its stored water, it will raise the average global sea level by about 16 feet. That will be enough for some cities all over the world to completely disappear. Perhaps the first to turn into a water world will be Thailand's capital, Bangkok which is just 5 feet above sea level. Then it will be Amsterdam in the Netherlands, followed by Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, Cardiff in the UK, and New Orleans in the US. People do a lot of work in Antarctica now, residing there for many months at a time to study this mystery of a continent. 
Over the years, even a few children were born there. But it's not a country, and the land doesn't belong to anyone. It's governed by the Antarctic Treaty System, an agreement of peaceful research and collaboration that suspends all territorial claims. It was first signed by 12 nations, and now there are 59 supporters, half of whom have decision-making powers. The continent is occupied all year round by researchers from all over the world. There are about 5,000 people living there in summer and about 1,000 in winter. Yet no one is a permanent resident there. People come and go, and the scientists take turns spending time there. The average yearly temperature there is negative 30 degrees. But there was a time when Antarctica was about as warm as Melbourne, Australia is today. It was about 40 to 50 million years ago. Yeah, I wasn't around then. But the continent had green forests and dinosaurs roaming its land, chilling in the sun in a 63-degree Fahrenheit environment. That was before penguins. In our age, it's so cold that you won't even find any trees or bushes in Antarctica. Just the snow. The only plants that can thrive in such extreme temperatures are lichens, moss, and algae. People can't stand such freezing conditions for lengthy periods of time either. So the continent has never had any indigenous population. Well, that is, if we don't count penguins, seals, whales, and a few other types of birds that live there now. Antarctica's fauna is the scariest and least diverse on the planet because only a few organisms can withstand its harsh conditions and because non-natives aren't allowed to be brought there. So if you decide to travel to Antarctica with your cat, well, you can't. Hey, I don't make the rules. But those few species that live on the South Pole totally own the place. There are no more than 5,000 people there and around 20 million penguins. They are a kind of settlers, though. Penguins' first ancestors lived in Australia and New Zealand. There are still a few penguin species there, including the smallest penguin on Earth that is just one foot tall. Still, most of the penguins migrated to Antarctica at some point, possibly because they were attracted by the greater food supply there. It's not the cold that made them like the land. It turns out, most penguins leave the continent when the summer ends. The only ones that stay there are male emperor penguins. And they do it to warm and protect eggs left by their mates. But where do all the other penguins go? At first, it was a big mystery even to scientists. But then they attached some tiny location devices to the legs of a few of these animals and figured it out. Penguins go to live in the southern oceans while it's too cold in Antarctica. None of them go ashore for half a year until they get back to the continent. When they come back, it's when those eggs, left for male penguins to nurture, start hatching. And so, penguin families can be together when it happens. Penguins eat different fish, and the ocean is full of those despite its cold temperature. In some areas, water can reach below freezing temperatures because it's salty. But fish don't freeze there because they have antifreeze proteins in their bodies. Then there are also about a million seals in Antarctica. They like fish too and they can hold their breath underwater for two hours. They see way better underwater than in the bright light of the day, and they also use their whiskers to locate food. Their breathing holes in the ice can freeze while seals are away, and they must use their teeth to make a new one. Seals can even sleep underwater, and then resurface occasionally to get some air without waking up. I can appreciate that. <laughs> you come to sunny California and go for a hike in the Santa Lucia Mountains. There, you have a strange, unpleasant feeling, as if someone's watching you. You look around, but don't see a single soul. That's when you glance at the tops of distant mountains in front of you, and your heart skips a beat. Up on the peaks, you can see the outline of a giant humanoid figure, arms stretched out with a magnificent full rainbow circling it. This mysterious figure is dressed in all black. You can't make out any facial expressions or detail, but you can see it moving. Then it vanishes right before your eyes. Congrats! You've just witnessed the Dark Watchers, a phenomenon that's been terrifying hikers in the California mountains for over 300 years. Even now, scientists can't give an exact explanation for this mysterious appearance. What we do know is, it's completely natural, uh, probably. One theory claims that there are no silhouettes at all. The human brain just thinks up images created by shadows the clouds cast on the mountains. 
Over the centuries, people share stories about this legend, and their minds begin to show it, building recognizable images. The same can happen to you, like when you see the contours of a human face on a burnt piece of toast, or the shape of a dog in a passing cloud. The most accepted scientific explanation is what's called a Brocken specter. It's when sunlight gets bent by drops of fog or clouds. That explains the rainbow surrounding these figures. As for the shadow, it's only your own being stretched and projected on the mountains before you. After all, these figures usually show up when the sun is behind the witness. Natural or not, the vanishing mysterious figure scared the wits out of you. So you head east and find yourself in the desert. The blazing sun beats down on your back. There's nothing for hundreds of miles around. Hard to believe this dry, lifeless plain was once the bottom of a lake. You notice a long trail in the sand, as if someone was pushing or pulling something really heavy across the ground. You follow the strange trail, and at the end you find a single large stone. But why would anyone drag a heavy rock across the middle of the desert? But nothing touched the stone. It moved by itself. It's a phenomenon called sailing stones. Every winter, ice covers the ground here. When a strong enough wind blows, the stone starts to glide across the slippery surface. Once the ice melts, all that's left is a winding trail behind a single lonesome rock. Well, for some relief from the scorching California sun, we head to Antarctica. Snow, ice, and more blinding sun. Yep, it's a desert too. The light is almost blinding. You squint, and off in the distance, you see something red sticking out from all the surrounding endless white. As you get closer, you realize it's a waterfall, an ominous red cascade flowing from the glacier. Splashes fly in all directions and stain the white snow. Don't worry, these so-called blood falls are nothing of the sort. Millions of years ago, I wasn't around then, A glacier formed over a pond and blocked access to sunlight, heat, and oxygen. Then the pond managed to break through the glacier with a little trickle of water. When such salty water with high levels of iron meets oxygen, it creates that scarlet rust color. This is the only waterfall of its kind in the world. Now, in the town of Taos, New Mexico, locals hear a strange hum every day. But not all of them. For some reason, only about 2% of the residents can hear the sound. Some theories proposed it's caused by the location's unusual acoustics. Others put it down to some strange auditory hallucination or even something more sinister. (laughs) Unexplainable sounds happen on other worlds as well. In 2020, the Mars rover recorded a strange hum coming from the red planet. It's a quiet, continuous drone that sometimes fluctuates because of Mars quakes. Back on Earth, we head to the warm rainforest of Southeast Asia. You see a tree that looks as if someone poured paint all over it. But the rainbow eucalyptus was painted by nature. Its unusual bark changes colors over time like a kaleidoscope. It starts off as a bright green shade, then red, orange, purple, and finally brown. Then the colorful cycle starts again. One of the biggest mysteries of nature is ball lightning. It's a glowing blue, orange, or yellow sphere that appears during a thunderstorm. Many witnesses say they hear a hissing sound and detect a strong odor with it. The first mention of ball lightning described it breaking through a window and disappearing. As with any mystery, scientists can't explain the exact cause. A popular theory is that ordinary lightning strikes the ground and causes a reaction between oxygen and vaporized soil elements. Ball lightning often occurs during earthquakes, when it usually takes the form of a blue flame coming out of the ground. The ball lightning phenomenon happens all over the world, but so far, no one's been able to snap a picture of it. There's an extremely unusual volcano in Java. If you go there at night, you'll see an electric blue flame burning from the ground, along with oozing bright blue lava. It's incredibly hot, but that's not actually lava. All this unusual blue is sulfur gas escaping from crevices in the volcano and catching on fire. It also condenses into a liquid form and looks like blue lava flowing down. As soon as you come to the Nambib Desert, you immediately notice something very strange. Sprinkled among the dry grasslands are almost perfect circles of dirt where nothing grows. 
These massive polka dots are called fairy circles, and, you guessed it, nobody really knows what causes them. The likely culprit is termites eating the grass around their underground colony. Well, that could explain the circle's differing sizes. The bugs continue to eat as the colony expands outwards, but they stop before they encroach on a neighboring colony. The patches where you do see grass show a sort of boundary separating different termite populations. Or so goes the theory. Heading down under to Australia's Lake Hillier. Your eyes don't deceive you. Yes, that lake is bubblegum pink and is perfectly safe to swim in. The giant pink puddle is a salt lake, and it's not the only one of its kind in the world. Salt lakes are pink because of a kind of algae and other microorganisms living in them. They produce a red pigment to protect themselves from the sun. What's unique about Lake Hillier, though, is the water is still pink even if you scoop it up into a glass, and it remains bright pink all year round. The same can't be said about other pink lakes. Japan is home to one of the most famous active volcanoes in the world. It's special because it creates an incredible natural phenomenon, a dirty thunderstorm. The volcano regularly spews out a black cloud of smoke, ash, and lightning. During an ordinary storm, ice crystals collide with each other and cause discharge, creating lightning. In a dirty thunderstorm, particles of volcanic ash collide instead of ice. A peaceful night on the beach, the waves wash up on the shore and glow neon blue. But it's not the water that's glowing, it's the creatures living in it. This phenomenon is called bioluminescence. Plankton and algae release this glow when waves disturb them. Some fish, squid, and crustaceans can emit neon light as well to lure prey. No time to walk along the shore enjoying the natural light show. Hurry, we're heading out to open sea. There's no storm or wind at all. Which is why it's so surprising when you see a massive wave five stories high suddenly sweep across the calm waters. It nearly overturns your boat. But just as soon as it arrives, it vanishes in an instant. What was that? This unpredictable and still unexplained danger is called a rogue wave. One theory of how they form is from the sea's surface encountering a strong headwind. But remember, you didn't feel any wind blowing. Theory number two, and the most accepted one, different waves combine to form one large one. It's something called kinetic vampirism. Under certain natural conditions, waves accumulate and exchange kinetic energy. Among all the waves, there will be one that absorbs the energy from the others like a vampire. When a lot of energy is accumulated, it releases itself in the form of a giant wave. Hey, don't we all love wintertime? Gingerbread cookies and sitting by the fireplace. And frozen methane bubbles? Freezing temperatures afford humanity the pleasure of some very weird winter phenomena. Let's go take a look at some of them. Beneath the surface of Canada's Lake Abraham in Alberta, or beneath other lakes across Antarctica, you'll witness a truly mesmerizing phenomenon of ice bubbles. From the top, they look like glittering jewels. But these bubbles don't meet our expectations, as they never pop. They just freeze midway, before ever reaching the surface. So how did they get there in the first place? And what are they made of? Some of them come from gas released from the melting of glaciers, while others are a result of the decomposing of organic matter lying at the bottom of the lakes. Now, they sure look pretty, but they're also pretty harmful to human life. These bubbles are made of methane, and they can intoxicate you. So if I were you, I wouldn't get too close. If you're driving on a curvy hillside road when a snow squall begins, you'd be wise to stop driving immediately. A snow squall is the winter equivalent of a severe thunderstorm. The thing is, they're difficult to predict and very fast moving. There can be sunshine, but then all of a sudden, a huge snow squall might start. If you haven't heard this term before, it's because the National Weather Service in the US only began using it in 2018. They called it a squall because it reduces a lot of our visibility and can be very dangerous if you don't take it seriously. But still, falling snow is beautiful, 
even if it's that crazy. Say this winter you decided to finally visit the famous Niagara Falls. Located between the US and Canada, these falls are the fifth largest waterfall in the world, with over 3,000 tons of falling water per second. In winter, the area looks like a winter wonderland and is home to an interesting phenomenon, a frozen fall. No, this isn't the work of Hollywood or an internet prank. Niagara Falls can actually form a layer of ice. This happens when the falls have been exposed to frigid temperatures for a long time. So, the surface water and mist in the air turn to ice, giving the impression that the entire waterfall is frozen. But that's not exactly what happens. If you look closely into the ice, you'll notice that there's still plenty of flowing water. Have you ever heard of something called a natural snowball? This is a rare yet beautiful environmental phenomenon that happens when smaller pieces of ice end up being rolled by strong winds and water. The further they roll, the more ice they gather, and the more that ice is polished. They end up as giant, perfectly shaped snowballs. They would look pretty amazing on their own, but hundreds of them together? <laughs> That's some scenery. Some snowballs turn into huge rolling donuts. These rare shapes happen only in perfect temperature conditions, when the snow is in the perfect state between hard and fluffy. It happens when a snowball begins rolling down, gathering more and more snow until suddenly its middle part collapses. This allows for the snowball to get its donut shape. Hmm, does it also taste as good as a donut? I guess not, right? Oh, almost forgot. If you want to see them in real life, you have to go to some severely cold places. But still, people reported having seen them in Ottawa, in the Midwest of the US, and even in Scotland. If you go for a walk in the woods at the beginning of winter, you might stumble upon a magical phenomenon known as frost flowers. These flower-shaped phenomena are rare and occur only when the temperature of the air is freezing but the ground is still moist. When the perfect conditions align, vapor coming out of stems form these veil-thin patterns that make up delicate flower-like ice. Don't try to pick them, you'll break them. And certainly don't try to plant them anywhere else, as they aren't real flowers. Oh, and be sure to go before the sun is too strong, otherwise it'll melt these delicate things. Say you just check the forecast and the weather for the day is negative 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Maybe you'd choose staying home underneath the blankets, but I'm sure you'd change your mind if you had the option of this day trip. Picture Yellowstone Park under a few feet of snow on a sunny day. Well, if that didn't do it for you, then add some snow-covered bison and steamy geysers to the scenery. Still not convinced? How about the chance to see the rare phenomenon of hoarfrost? If you haven't heard of them before, they're a geometrically enchanting type of frost that you can see when moisture in the air skips the droplet stage and appears directly as ice crystals on top of a leaf. They're much more photogenic than your windshield or garden variety frost. FYI, the term hoarfrost comes from Old English meaning a frost that resembles an old man's beard. Well, what do you say? Does this actually look like a beard? You're walking in a frost-covered forest on a freezing day, when suddenly you hear a loud banging sound. No, it's not an avalanche nor an earthquake. You're in the middle of a frost quake. If only that meant that you'd see beautiful snow crystals cracking on the floor, but that's not quite the case. Frost quakes, also known as ice quakes, happen when the moisture below the ground starts to freeze and expand. It's normal for things to expand in their frozen state. Just look at an ice cube, for example. These frost quakes can move rocks and the soil above and cause loud cracking sounds as if the world were falling apart. Don't worry though, it's not. If you happen to see black ice, be careful. Although we call it that, black ice isn't really black. It's made up of a thin layer of ice that looks black due to the color of concrete or earthy ground. 
it blends in so well with the ground that it's almost impossible to spot. It forms during winter days when the ground is wet from rain or melted snow, and the temperature suddenly drops below freezing temperatures. So, this thin layer emerges, multiplying considerably your chances of slipping while walking on bridges or overpasses. It's also pretty common on spots on the road that are shaded by trees. This next phenomenon happens in a very specific wintry context, the Antarctic one. Amongst the unique things that occur on the continent, Antarctica is home to an extremely weird waterfall. The year was 1911, when an Australian geologist wondered about the so-called blood falls. He was extremely puzzled by this red stream of liquid pouring from a small hillside amongst the Antarctic ice. After years of studying, it was understood that what caused the redness was the high iron content in the water. The last piece of the puzzle came when scientists discovered that there was an underground lake with water full of oxidized iron nearby, which was what caused the blood fall to exist in the first place. The North Pole is more than Santa's fictional home. Together with the South Pole, it's home to the so-called polar vortex, a phenomenon that helps to enhance our winter experience. The polar vortex is a large area of low pressure and cold air. It's called a vortex simply because over there the air rotates counterclockwise. It sends a jet stream that makes you want to bundle up and helps induce several winter phenomena such as freezing fog. If fog is when a cloud touches the ground, what happens when it freezes? You can expect that all of the moist droplets of water that are hanging around in the air will possibly freeze when they touch the ground, meaning you really wouldn't want to be driving around in the middle of one of these things. It's winter, 1980. We're in the small town of Lengbe. 19-year-old Jean Hilliard is driving home after meeting with a friend. She takes a shortcut and turns into an icy, slippery road. In the dark, she loses control of the rear-wheel drive car. The vehicle crashes into a ditch. Emergency lights, snowfall, night, and a hard frost. Jean gets out of the vehicle. She's wearing only a light winter coat, mittens, and cowboy boots. The air temperature is much lower than in a freezer. Jean is sure that her friend lives nearby, so she goes that way. She climbs a high hill and realizes she's taken the wrong route. It seems she's gotten lost. The girl wanders a couple more miles and notices her other friend's house in the distance. Freezing, she walks there. Then everything turns black. Jean loses consciousness. The next morning, rancher Wally Nelson wakes up in a great mood. It's the holiday season. There's a winter fairy tale outside the window. He leaves his house and notices the body of Jean Hilliard lying just a few feet from his porch. Wally approaches the girl, shakes her, and is horrified. Her body is stiff and cold like frozen wood. Her eyes are open and don't move. Her hair is frozen. She just doesn't look alive. But Wally sees that she's still breathing. Jean has managed to survive. Wally wants to put her in his car to bring her to the doctor. But the girl's body doesn't bend and can't fit into the auto. It feels like a statue. He takes a bigger car and rushes to the hospital as fast as possible. The doctors take Jean, but they don't think she has any chance to make it. Her hand is so hard and frozen that no needle can penetrate it. A low temperature, glassy eyes, and muscles as hard as stone are all the results of emergency mode. Her body has directed all the blood to the vital organs to ensure their functioning. That's why other parts of her body look so lifeless and her skin and muscles don't react to anything. The doctors decide to put heating pads on the girl to warm her up. 
Her family hopes for her recovery, but right now, all they can do is just wait. Frostbite is so dangerous because all that frozen liquid begins to expand. Fill a small bottle with water and put it in the freezer for a few hours. Then take it out and you'll see that the bottle seems to have expanded or even cracked because of the increased volume of the liquid. The same thing happens inside our bodies. We consist of almost 70% water. When it freezes, its particles turn into ice crystals and tear cell membranes. Ice fragments can stretch and destroy tissue. This is called frostbite. Also, our body can slow down all internal processes in extreme cold conditions to save strength and energy. The heart makes fewer beats, and the lungs stop consuming lots of oxygen. Metabolism slows down. It happened with Jean, and perhaps it is what saved her life that day. She was lying in the snow in severe frost for about 6 hours. But why didn't the ice particles start destroying her cell membranes? How did her body withstand such damage and manage to survive? Back at the hospital, doctors are happy to watch Jean get better. Warm blood spreads through the frozen vessels and brings her body back to life. Surprisingly, ice crystals haven't damaged her muscles and skin. A few hours later, the girl regains consciousness. By noon, she starts talking. Jean doesn't know what happened. She remembers walking to her friend's house and then waking up in the hospital. What worries her most right now is that her father's car is somewhere in a ditch. As it turns out, the girl fell down and crawled on all fours to Wally Nelson's house. She doesn't remember it, but apparently, her brain activated the survival instinct that night. Unfortunately, she didn't manage to crawl the last few feet. Jean passed out at the door and stayed there for six hours. Doctors examine the girl and understand that she's completely healthy. Soon, she's discharged from the hospital. This case isn't unique. One professor of emergency medicine, David Plummer, said he'd seen about 12 similar cases over the past 10 years when patients had survived severe frostbite. Jean returns home and finds out that she has become famous. People write about her in newspapers, want to interview her, and film documentary shows. Her case has attracted the attention of many doctors around the world, but no one has been able to find out exactly how she managed to survive. In the case of humans, such recoveries seem like an absolute miracle. But many creatures of the natural world can adapt their bodies to extreme conditions. One of them is the tree frog. These animals live mainly in temperate and tropical parts of Eurasia. Sometimes they have to contend with cold weather. Their body injects glucose into the bloodstream when they feel they're freezing. And the content of their cells turns into syrup. Sugar lowers the freezing point of water. So, tree frogs have adapted to such conditions. The water outside their cells can freeze. Their bodies can get as hard as ice cubes. But they will be alive, feeling great. Then, when it gets warmer, they fully recover. The blood fills their body and puts all their muscles in motion. But one of the most amazing animals that can withstand freezing temperatures is the ghoulish ice fish. It's transparent and somewhat like a jellyfish. It swims in the dark, cold Antarctic waters. The ghoulish ice fish feels comfortable there because of the antifreeze in its body. More precisely, it's a unique substance that is like antifreeze in its functions. This liquid doesn't allow the animal's cells, organs, and the whole body to freeze. There are no red blood cells in the fish's blood that transport oxygen throughout its body. This is the only vertebrate with such a superpower. There are organisms on our planet that use the cold to prolong their life. Scientists have found some of them in the ice of Siberia. Those are microscopic, multi-celled creatures, like small worms, that can live in a freezer for about 10 years. But the worms from Siberia were about 24,000 years old. The scientists transported them to the laboratory and thawed them. The worms came to life and began to multiply immediately after all those centuries of sleep. Their bodies can go into cryptobiosis. 
This is when an entire frozen organism has minimal vital functions. The analysis showed that the worms could stay in this mode for tens of thousands of years. And there are many such animals on our planet. Also, these creatures are some of the world's most resistant to radiation. They are practically invulnerable. Now back to our story. It's possible that Gene Hilliard's body went into short cryptobiosis. Perhaps there was some non-freezing liquid in the girl's blood. But no one knows for sure. These days, she has an ordinary job and almost doesn't remember that day. Further research on this topic can help scientists create special medicines that can help in freezing temperatures. Just imagine that you could safely go outside in the winter wearing a t-shirt and a pair of shorts. Steam would be coming off your body, and the ice under your feet would be melting. You'd feel hot inside. A dream, perhaps. But realistically, winter coat manufacturers would, of course, never allow it. You turn on the tap in the bathroom and rinse your face with warm water. After a few seconds, a loud grinding noise comes from the water pipes. In the next second, huh? pieces of ice fall into your hands. You huh. jump up in surprise and hear a neighbor screaming behind the wall. He's probably taking a shower. You pull the handle, but the water doesn't flow. Mm -hmm. Then you notice a thick layer of ice sticks out of the tap. It looks like an icicle. You go to the kitchen and take a jug of water, but you can't pour any into a glass. The water's <gasps> frozen. The same thing happens with the kettle. You can hear the pipes roaring. All the water in the city has frozen, and this has led to a water supply collapse. The water's flowing freely through the winding pipes. It's going up down and to the sides through a complex sewer system. Then it turns into ice and expands. Plastic and metal pipes can't stand it. They pop and tear apart. If the water becomes liquid again, the city will be instantly flooded. All sewage water will accumulate underground and rise. But now the water has frozen for a few seconds, so millions of tons of ice lie under the streets. This is happening all over the world, and no one knows the reason for it. Even in the tropical jungles of the Amazon and in the African savannas, all lakes, rivers, and ponds have frozen despite the high air temperature. The huge amount of ice lowers the temperature of the entire planet. It gets cooler in the parched deserts, and it gets even colder in the north. You turn on the kettle to melt the water, but it doesn't work. A hydroelectric power plant that feeds the city has broken down and disconnected people from electricity. You go outside and see scared people who can't take a sip from frozen bottles. The city fountain has turned into an ice sculpture. The lake in the park is an ice rink where you can play hockey. You're shivering because it has quickly become cold outside. Several people make a bonfire in the city square and put bottles next to it. This helps to melt the water. You decide to warm up by the fire and watch the news on your phone. All the waterfalls on the planet look like they're frozen in time. Right now, the ships sailing in the seas and oceans are stuck. To get to the shore, people need to hollow out thousands of miles of ice. This is impossible, so helicopters with rescuers fly to their side to save the sailors. A small piece of ice falls on the screen of your phone and leaves a scratch. An icy rain begins. Drops of various shapes and sizes fall to the ground and break like glass. All the people are hiding under their roofs. All the animals are running under the trees. Icy rain hits the ground, scratches cars, breaks windows. When it ends, a collapse begins. Sharp ice flows crunch under your feet. Cars can't drive normally. Traffic jams form on the roads. At the moment when the water froze, many surfers were catching waves on the coast of many countries. Here's one of them rowing to a big wave, standing on the surfboard. The wave rises, twists, and freezes. At a huge speed, the surfer slides on the ice and falls. He looks at the frozen ocean and goes home to put on his skates. Fishing has stopped all over the world. To catch a fish, you need to drill the ice and carefully remove the frozen fish. All the sea creatures are alive. They're simply in cryogenic sleep. Every day, 
rescuers pull out people stuck in the ice. Imagine you're swimming and everything around you freezes. You can't move. It's nearly impossible to breathe. Your head is now covered with an ice crust. All you can do is scream and move your face muscles. You spend hours calling for help and waiting for rescuers to take you out from the ice. Cargo transportation on huge ships has stopped. Import and export of various goods and natural resources are impossible now. This causes a shortage of fuel in some countries, since oil can't be delivered quickly by ship. Other countries don't get enough vegetables and fruits. This causes high prices for many things, and the world's economy becomes unstable. People buy up all the home heaters to melt water in bottles. The water supply is broken, and everybody goes outside with buckets to collect pieces of icy rain falling from the sky. At home, they melt liquid in iron buckets. This is impossible in your city, since the work of the hydroelectric power station still isn't restored. You and other residents create bonfires right on the streets to melt ice. Meanwhile, a real catastrophe is going on in the seas and oceans. Seaweed and phytoplankton absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen. More than 50% of the fresh air on Earth is provided thanks to this process. Now, everything is frozen and oxygen production is suspended. After a few months, people will begin to notice that they have breathing problems. More and more carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere. Because of this, the blue sky turns gray. The rain doesn't feed the forests and jungles anymore. It destroys them. Trees, leaves, and plants are torn under the ice drops. The harvest is spoiling. People are running out of food supplies all over the world. Volcanoes emit a lot of carbon dioxide and heat. It can thaw all the frozen water, but it'll take millions of years. The Earth's temperature has dropped, which slows down the melting. Only on the coasts of the southern countries does the ice slowly begin to melt. But this is not enough to save the planet from disaster. The most destructive processes occur not on the water, but on the land. Cities located at the foot of the hills and mountain villages are being evacuated. Residents take their things and leave their houses as far away as possible because lakes and rivers are flowing inside many mountains and underground. And when all this water freezes, it begins to expand inside the underground channels. The same happened to the city pipes. When everything starts to collapse inside the mountain, a landslide begins. Rocks and mountains roll down onto small towns. Earthquakes carry trees and houses underground. This is happening all over the planet. To escape from the icy rains, people create umbrellas of light metal. If you decide to go outside in bad weather, you need to wear headphones or earplugs because the ringing of falling ice on the metal umbrella is deafening. It's necessary to protect plants and crops from ice. People put huge transparent domes over farms and fields. The domes are equipped with transparent high-strength fabric. Ice pieces don't break through it, but remain on the dome. When the sun begins to melt the ice, it seeps through the grid and waters the ground. Scientists create super powerful electric stations and install them at different spots of the ocean. The stations are equipped with big drills that make a long tunnel into the ocean depths. Then, a powerful nuclear reactor is placed there. It's covered with a protective shield to avoid radiation entering the water. The reactor starts working and melts the water around. When a huge amount of water is melted, the reactor is removed from the ocean. Then, the warm water begins to heat the frozen water. These processes take decades. While the seas are melting, people in cities are reinstalling sewage systems. First, a powerful heater is placed inside each house, which slowly melts the ice. Then, plumbers replace the broken pipes with new ones. The global temperature is slowly recovering, but icy rains continue to fall. To solve this problem, scientists synthesize a harmless chemical reagent. Each day, supersonic planes fly through rain clouds and spray the substance that turns small ice flows into water drops. The freezing water in the rocks slowly melts, and this provokes new landslides. To escape from earthquakes, seismologists create a scanner that monitors the activity of underground water. 
the scanner processes data on the ice and ground temperatures and the density of air and soil and creates an earthquake model. People can find out in advance when the disaster will begin. We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior, which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent, so your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress, but there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows, maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent and called it Antarctos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the Northern Hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773 in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs, indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820, during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen, as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. 
The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, with stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals. With their furry bodies and special songs, these marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. It's indeed like a whale buffet down there. Look at those lush coniferous forests and tundra. What a wonderland. You may have mistakenly thought it's Canada, but it's not. It's Antarctica, about 34 million years ago. So what makes Antarctica this frigid today? It turns out a mix of dropping carbon dioxide levels and some tectonic shuffle played a huge role in transforming this ice-free paradise into the frozen continent we know now. About 50 million years ago, CO2 concentrations were sky high, strutting around at around 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million. But as those levels tumbled down, global temps started to drop, paving the way for the mighty ice sheets that later took over Antarctica. While the CO2 dive was happening, tectonic activity was also working its magic. The big split between South America and Antarctica opened up the Drake Passage, which created the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. This powerful current acted like a bouncer, keeping warm air and ocean currents from crashing the Antarctic party and helping keep things rather frosty. 
If you mix up Australia and Antarctica, you're not that wrong. These two continents used to be one. If you mix up Austria and Australia, it's much worse. By the way, don't fall for the internet myths and memes. There's no help desk in Austria specifically for people who intended to fly to Australia. Now, look at this magnificent Australian pink beach. It's precious and not in a figurative sense. Those mysterious pinkish sands are actually garnet and it's widely used in jewelry. Geologists studied those sands and came to the conclusion that the garnet contained there is older than local mountains. That doesn't make sense, right? In fact, it does. You see, Australia didn't used to be this very detached continent as it is now. Many, many millions of years ago, Australia and Antarctica were part of the supercontinent Gondwana, and glacial erosion released the garnet, which eventually made its way to the beach. These sands formed when South Australia was flat and chill, long before the mountains appeared. Most garnet gets washed away, but this batch has a rich history, tracing back to glacial rocks in the Transantarctic Mountains. So this pink sand comes from an ancient mountain range hidden under Antarctic ice. Not only does Antarctica ice hide gems like garnet, if you look harder, you might find entire buildings. Sounds insane, but this is exactly what a British explorer did. His name is Chris Brown, and he uncovered an entire building beneath the ice. He was traveling to the Pole of Inaccessibility, and it all started with a bummer. Chris and his son had their plane broken. Suddenly, they spotted a lone bust peeking out of the snow. This place was an old meteorological station. Despite freezing conditions, Chris and his son Micah had a blast exploring. Chris is on a mission to conquer all seven earthbound poles of inaccessibility and has tackled five so far. I guess you already know that Antarctica is the largest desert on Earth, much larger than the Sahara or the Gobi. Still, despite being the driest continent on Earth, it boasts a seriously weird waterfall. Nestled in the mesmerizing McMurdo Dry Valleys, it's five stories tall and looks like it's gushing blood. It's even called Blood Falls. It may look outlandish and even frightening, but its nature can be easily explained. The water that creates this crimson cascade was once a salty lake, but over time, it became sealed off from the outside world when glaciers formed on top of it. Now, this ancient water hanging out 1,300 feet below the surface has cranked up its salt levels to three times saltier than the ocean. This salt water is also loaded with iron and gets zero oxygen or sunlight. When the iron-rich water trickles through a crack in the glacier and meets the air, it rusts up, turning dark red. You may have mistakenly heard that no bug species belongs to Antarctica, but it's not exactly true because there's this tiny Antarctic midge living there. Plus, there are some spiders too. Those aren't your average spiders hanging out in the darkest corners of your apartment. Those are critters lurking in the chilly darkness of the Antarctic Ocean floor. These little marine creepers are actually anthropods and can stretch around 20 inches across. As if that wasn't bizarre enough, they also breathe through little holes in their legs. Quick question. What's the color that you associate most with Antarctica? I'm sure it's white. That's my association too. However, Antarctica may look like a slice of watermelon. That colorful snow comes courtesy of a tough little algae called Chlamydomonas nivalis. When things start to warm up during the Antarctic summer, these little guys release their vibrant red and green spores, painting the snow in wild and funky colors. But it's best to steer clear because that snow is not just a pretty sight. It's also toxic and definitely not edible. Searching for fossils is always a blast, but when you're in one of the most remote spots on the planet, it gets even more exciting. A diverse team of scientists recently hit the mother load pulling in over a ton of fossils from ancient marine life, dinosaurs, and birds from the late Cretaceous period, about 71 million years ago. Their adventure kicked off with a flight to South America, followed by a five-day trek through the infamous Drake Passage. Upon reaching Antarctica, they set up camp using helicopters and inflatable boats. You might be thinking, 
Why dig in Antarctica with all that ice? Well, it turns out there are places where rocks pop up, depending on the season. The team went to James Ross Island, located in the Antarctic Peninsula, and they went there during February and March. And that's one of the few parts of Antarctica where in summer, rocks are exposed, and those rocks can come from the age of dinosaurs. The expedition was a success, as they discovered over a ton of remarkable finds. Next up, the fossils will head to Chile before making their way to Pittsburgh's Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Among their discoveries, they found relics dating back about 71 million years, alongside some around 67 million years old, including plenty of snails, clams, and various marine creatures. Yikes! Look at this creepy seaworm. It could live in LA and be a star in a horror movie, but it chooses to call the chilly waters of the Southern Ocean near Antarctica its home. These worms can grow up to 8 inches long and 4 inches wide, but don't let their spooky exterior trick you. Research suggests they might actually be superheroes in disguise, playing a vital role in keeping ecosystems buzzing. Now, see that head? It's not really a head, it's just a retractable throat that helps this toothy creature chow down on its meals. Antarctica has many creepy critters to offer. Let me introduce you to the Antarctic Strawberry Feather Star. It's not like Patrick from SpongeBob, though. It's more like a deep-sea creature straight out of a horror movie. Picture this. 20 wiggly arms, some stretching up to 8 inches, all decked out with these bizarre little bumps. Yikes, indeed. Back in 2014, scientists buried 34 seismic monitors in the snow on the Ross Ice Shelf, which is huge. Think of it as an ice slab the size of Texas, just chilling over the Southern Ocean. These clever little machines picked up a nearly non-stop buzzing. Even though our human ears usually can't catch these low-frequency sounds, scientists have worked their magic and made them audible for us. They even shared the creepy audio online. A glaciologist from the University of Chicago says that if you could hear this vibration, it'd sound like a swarm of cicadas taking over the backyard in late summer. But these glacier explorers weren't trying to capture spooky tunes. They're actually on a mission to monitor the Ross ice shelf because things are heating up, literally. And the ice is melting faster than ice cream on a hot day. Ice shelves are like Earth safety plugs, keeping all that massive ice from surging into the ocean. So what exactly is making all that noise? It's likely just strong winds whipping across ice dunes, creating a kind of natural vibration. So what comes to your mind when you hear the word Antarctica? Most likely, cold, snow, ice, and penguins. <laughs> Yet, this is one of the least explored regions in the world that hides many strange and unique things. Check them out! You don't have to go to Antarctica to see this weird thing. All you need to do is open Google Earth and move to one of the southernmost islands of Antarctica, King George Island. Recently, internet users have noticed a large and pretty strange cave entrance there. Where does this wide, dark passage lead? People started making suggestions. It's the entrance to a secret base or some laboratory. This is the part of the spaceship that crashed there thousands of years ago. This is the door to the ancient city of Antarctica. Perhaps there's a giant rock mountain with an ancient cave beneath all this snow and ice. Well, there's some ideas. Users have calculated the approximate dimensions of this cave. It might be about 74 feet high and 250 feet wide. You could hide a Boeing passenger jet in there. Nature probably created this entrance. This is a logical explanation, but there are two strange factors. First, take a look at the foot of the mountain. It seems that there are steps there. They're dark in color, as if they're made of stone. And if you look closely, you can notice something similar to human footprints. Has anyone entered this cave? Or maybe someone is still living there now. The second oddity is the disappearance of the mysterious finding. For the first time, people noticed it in a Google Maps snap in 2007. Then the entrance disappeared. Then it reappeared a few years later. After that, it vanished. And in 2022, people saw it again. 
Perhaps old snow melts, a new layer falls, and then the wind blows it away and the cycle repeats. But the alleged steps leading deep into the cave make one doubt the natural origin of this tunnel. You can easily find the coordinates on the internet and visit the cave via Google Earth. You might see something there and tell the world. There's another strange thing people discovered with the help of Google Earth. In 2020, one user found a strange object that looked like a giant ship 100 miles off the coast of Antarctica. It was covered with ice and snow and lying on its side. It looked like a cruise ship. You could notice the windows, the deck, and the bridge. But not all people agreed with this. Some claimed it was a spaceship. Others said it was some kind of secret building. The user who first noticed the ship stated that its size was about 400 feet, which is the perfect length for a passenger vessel. But what is this ship doing in such a remote place in the middle of a glacier? How did it get here? Who was its captain? No one has found the answers to these questions yet. In 2016, people using Google Earth discovered a photo of an unknown sea monster floating off the coast of Antarctica. This creature resembled a giant squid with a length of about 200 feet. This is slightly shorter than three train cars. Just imagine this kraken swimming in Antarctica's dark icy waters and dragging to the bottom everything it meets on its way. Maybe it's the great and terrible Chulu, or one of its offspring. You will quickly notice this blood-red waterfall among Antarctica's endless, dazzling white landscapes. Don't worry, it's not blood. For many centuries, the waterfall has been painting snow in a bright red color. The stream flows straight out of a white iceberg. Let's look inside and find out what's happening there. Millions of years ago, there was a small, crystal-clear pond. But then a glacier formed around it. A thick layer of ice and snow blocks sunlight, heat, and oxygen access. For millennia, the reservoir remained in this cold vacuum. But at one point, the water made a hole in the icy wall and broke out. When this salty water comes into contact with oxygen, it immediately turns scarlet or rusty. Antarctica is the only place where you can find such a unique natural phenomenon. One of the driest places on Earth is located in Antarctica. It's one of the most lifeless deserts in the world, the McMurdo Dry Valleys. In this desert, you won't see the scorching sun, hot sand, and cacti. A desert means a place with a lack of precipitation and life. The McMurdo Dry Valleys meet these parameters. But this place is also unique for Antarctica, since you won't find glaciers there. Despite the frost, ice can't form in the desert because it hasn't rained for millions of years there. It also never snows. A strong wind coming from the mountains reaches speeds up to 200 miles per hour. It would be difficult for you to stay on your feet there. The wind is filled with moisture. It heats up and evaporates all the liquid and snow in the desert because of its high speed. Only dry air reaches the ground. But you can find several lakes there. They don't freeze, only thanks to the high concentration of salt. The water is so salty that large life forms can't develop there. But scientists have found microscopic organisms near the lakes. 20 million years ago, Antarctica was filled with swamps and trees and swarming with insects and animals. But now, it resembles the surface of Mars, literally. Scientists and astronauts are exploring such regions as the McMurdo Dry Valleys, since the natural conditions there are similar to those on the Red Planet. So, before you go to Mars, you can practice living in similar places on Earth. Also, scientists discovered an underwater world in the Antarctic filled with hundreds of amphipods, crustacean animals similar to shrimp. Wait a minute, it happened in the Antarctic? But the McMurdo Dry Valleys are located in Antarctica. Well, the words are very similar, but what is the difference? Oh, and don't forget the Arctic. The Antarctic is the region in the southernmost part of Earth that houses the continent of Antarctica. And the Arctic is another land altogether. They have the same natural conditions – frost, ice, and snow. But they're located in different parts of the planet. The Arctic is at the North Pole. Antarctica is at the South Pole. Now, back to the discovery. Scientists put forward theories that the ice of the Antarctic hides a vast network of freshwater rivers and lakes. And in 2022, they found a new ecosystem. 
Researchers explored the Antarctic Ross Ice Shelf and its underwater rivers. This is a massive piece of ice floating in the ocean. A team from New Zealand used a special drilling rig equipped with a hot water supply to drill a hole 1,640 feet deep. That's more than the height of the Empire State Building. Then, they lowered some video cameras and saw thousands of crustaceans swimming in different directions. So it seems they're very unorganized. In the waters of the Antarctic, you can also meet some of the scariest creatures on the planet. These are sea spiders. They got this name because they resemble land spiders. But they're actually a species of marine arthropods. And unlike land spiders, those in the ocean are much larger. They look like eight strong legs without a body. One such spider can be a dinner plate in width. Some of them have no eyes and have proboscises instead of jaws. Sea spiders are poorly studied because they live in deep, cold waters. Antarctica hides many little-known animals. There are long tunnels in its glaciers leading to scary darkness. On this cold continent, people have found the remains of giant dinosaurs and other ancient creatures, such as the ancestors of modern ducks. Many underground rivers and lakes hide unexplored wildlife. Even the ice here can be weird. Take a look at these striped icebergs. They have blue, black, green, and turquoise shapes. The color depends on the conditions of the water during freezing. For example, green lines appear because of algae, blue ones form when the water freezes too quickly. Okay, I'm freezing. Time to go thaw somewhere warmer. Hawaii. Yeah. There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment they can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. 
But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples, but because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. 
They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling, even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. 